Um, we are going to read the teaching text today, John 6, 60 through 70. He's changing the I'm changing versions, forgive me. Uh, Amazing. John, yes. <laughs> okay. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil." He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Before we jump in uh, to this uh, teaching for today, I just wanted to take a moment just to honor the folks who built our prayer room. Uh, Emily and Isaac Gay back in the day, Ashley Hebert rolled in, Reagan, who's probably down with the youth, It is a rare thing to have a church community that prays. Every day, three hours of prayer, rising up to God from the heart of our church, saying, Lord, we want you here. We want your presence, power, anointing in our lives, in our community, and in our city. And I don't want us to take that for a common thing. Much of the favor on our church comes from the painful place of obscure prayer. And so I just want to thank those folks who built it. Everybody loves to roll in when something's going well. But the people who see it when it sounds like a crazy idea, who say, I'm that kind of crazy, they're the people I'm grateful for. So thank you, folks, for for rolling in and making that happen. And I really do believe we're just in the early days of what it is that what God wants to do in our church through prayer. So I just want to encourage you uh, to press in and to make yourself available to the heart of God, the presence of God. You never know what happens in the prayer room. You never know what God will do. So I want to encourage you to be a part of that. Amen? Uh, A bit more. Amen? Amen. 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 We are in a series uh, on discipleship called The Way of Jesus, and we're all facing a giant unspoken problem in the church right now around discipleship. And here's the question, why, in spite of all of our books and reading, worship services, serving, content, podcasts, are we so undiscipled? Have you ever asked that question? Why shouldn't we be more different at this point of church history with this much information and this much understanding about who Jesus has called us to be? Why are we so undiscipled? And I think it's something, and I'm not saying this, why aren't you undiscipled? I'm asking the question myself, like, why aren't I more like Jesus? Well, if you've ever, you ever had that moment where you've read a book or read a phrase, and it just jumps out of the, out of the page, and then like pins you to the ground, and is like, listen to me, I'm talking to you. You ever had that? I had that last week, and this was the quote that hit me. This is Ruth Haley Barton. She says this, approaches to formation that focus only on those places where we are fairly well along can actually become a defense mechanism for avoiding awareness of those areas that are not yet formed in the image of Christ. The good parts of our discipleship can function as defense mechanisms to stop the rest of our discipleship. And she's making some extraordinary claims here that I I feel like have tremendous ramifications for us as followers of Jesus. Number one, our discipleship begins in the places we are undiscipled. And so instead of looking at your life and asking, where am I like Jesus? The confrontation is, where am I unlike Jesus? Your Your formation must face the places you are not formed like Christ. And this is one of the keys of the kingdom. 
We rarely look at the person of Jesus and see the way He confronts people for their lack of kingdom vision. Part of the reason is that we live in a culture that is obsessed with strengths. Do you guys do the strength finders? Here's my strengths, just while we're getting to know each other. (laughs) Futuristic, number one, strategic, intellection, ideation, relater. Now, I was talking with someone, this might be, I don't know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, forever ago. And I was having a conversation about why Strength Finders was so important or where it was birthed. I think it was Marcus Buckingham who sort of like put it all out there. And the response was, well, when you study the American psychological handbook of of psychological disorder, there's hundreds and hundreds of weaknesses in the human condition. But when it comes to strengths, there's so few. And so I think it was a a, a vision of, of correcting the overemphasis on weaknesses, but it's really gotten out of hand. Anything now can be framed as a strength. So let's just run through mine real quick. Futuristic, oh yeah, man, I'm a visionary. You know what I did last week? Like, what do you do for fun? It was like, well, I took half a day and I mapped out the last 25 years of evangelical trends. And I sat down and I thought, what's the next 25 years going to be so that kids just born into our church now will follow Jesus into their 20s? Like, what could it be year by year? How does technology, how does uh, globalization, how does, it, like, how does all of this affect how we do discipleship? It's like, there's nothing that brings me more joy than thinking about the future. And then strategic, I love coming up with a good plan. Forget chaos. Why have chaos when you can have a strategy? And then intellection, I love to learn. I love, if there's never been a chart I don't like. <laughs> Ideation, coming up with new ideas in the relator, which means... I'm really content with a small, tight group of friends. And so you people look at this and you go, wow, John's a visionary, a strategic, futurist leader. I mean, yeah. But it also means if I'm obsessed with the future that I can miss what's happening in the moment and neglect the past. It also means I can be so structured that I miss spontaneity. It also means I can be so involved in the mind I miss what's happening in the heart. It means I can be so busy thinking about new concepts that I can miss old relationships, and it can mean that I can close my heart off to new people. And so these, if we only have a paradigm of strength, my wife's number one strength is command. Her second strength is activator. So I live in the future and in my head, and she lives right here, right now. Look at me and do it. So much of what we do in the world is built on our strength. And the, the strategy is minimize your weakness, maximize your strength. And this may, may work well in some areas, but I will tell you this, it will not work well in the kingdom of God. The message of Jesus is not maximize your strengths and minimize your weaknesses. So much of the brokenness that we feel in our world today, so many of the public pastoral failures that make our hearts weep, uh, well, because of that message, just forget the weaknesses and look at the strengths. Look at how many people are coming to Jesus. Who are we to challenge the character? Look how much fruit there is. Can't point that out. So many of the heartbreaking things are because we let the paradigm of the strengths of the world dictate the culture of the church. And this happens, it can lead to a disaster. When the culture of the world becomes the culture of the church, it is the, the clock is ticking for a public fallout of some kind. And so what we have to realize is, is that we are called to more than anything to confront these areas of lack of formation and undiscipleship or lack of discipleship in our life in the way of Jesus. And Jesus in this passage that was read earlier says something hard. He starts preaching a hard gospel and says, from this point on, many of his disciples followed him no longer. And Jesus doesn't go, oh, sorry, let me adjust my message. He turns to his disciples and goes, do you want to leave too? And good old Peter's like, oh, probably, but honestly, where else are we going to go? Because you have the words of eternal life, like you kind of got us. Robert Mulholland says this, if indeed the work of God's formation in us is the process of forming us in the image of Christ, obviously it's going to take place at the points where we are not yet formed in that image. This means that one of the first dynamics of holistic spiritual formation will be confrontation. 
through some channel, the scripture, worship, a word of proclamation, the agency of a brother or sister in Christ, even the agency of an unbeliever, the Spirit of God may probe some area in which we are not formed in the image of Christ. And that probing will probably always be confrontational and will always be a challenge and a call to us in our brokenness to come out of the brokenness into wholeness in Christ. But it will also be a costly call because that brokenness is who we are. Look at the story of the rich young ruler. I mean, here's all you need to know about him. He was rich, he was young, and he was in charge. And you look at Jesus is working with fishermen, teenage fishermen. And at some point, you're probably thinking, at last, a cultural elite, or at least someone with some measure of maturity. He's rich, so we can finance the mission. He's young, he's got energy, and he's a leader, so he's got influence. And this rich young leader comes up to Jesus and falls on his knees before him. This is a, a public display of humbling himself before Jesus. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus says, well, you know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud on your father and mother. And he says, teacher, I have kept these things since I was a boy. He says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. This is one thing you like. Sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, then come, follow me. And at this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. But I can tell you right now, the rich young ruler would have made it onto the board of most churches. Would have just brought him in. Yeah, look, I know we don't, how can you even know his heart? Look at his external behavior, a lot of external fruit here. But Jesus goes straight to the point of weakness. He does not honor the strength. There's a principle, if we go to this slide of the barrel here, uh, which is very, very different than how the world works. And it basically says this, you will never rise above your character. And so a barrel can only hold as much water as its lowest point, not its highest point. Now, the street you're on is called Billionaire Row in Manhattan. You're on it right now. If you go that way, you'll realize there's some decently tall skyscrapers. And I just want you to see that it doesn't matter if you build one of the planks of that barrel as high as some of these buildings. It will be irrelevant to its capacity to carry because character, the lowest point of our character, is the point at which we have true kingdom influence. And so, again, in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus doesn't want to have a conversation about how high you can build your strengths. He wants to know which part of your character needs to be developed. Now, there's so many things when you go through the Gospels, when you realize this paradigm that true discipleship begins in the places we don't want to talk about, you realize how much Jesus begins to confront people. And I want to be very, very cautious here. I want to say this. You and I have a dangerous tradition. It's whenever we read the Gospels, we either read it like we're Jesus or the disciples getting it right. You're like, I'm with him. I am him or I'm with him. We never read it like I'm the Pharisee, I'm the sinner. I'm... We always read it like we're the insider, like we're the right people. And so as a result, Jesus is never confronting us. And that can be a way of reading the Gospels that only reaffirm the weaknesses of your formation. And so I want to highlight, I think, there's probably 40 things I could highlight. I don't know, some of you are sad we're not going to have time for all of those today, but I've tried to categorize them into four main things I think Jesus would say to a church like ours in a city like this. Four things Jesus would confront in discipleship. First one is this. I believe Jesus would confront religious superiority. Religious superiority. The church is, has an operating system, which is called the grace of God. And it gets poisoned when a pharisaical spirit of self-righteousness gets in. Jesus says to his followers, beware the yeast of the scribes and the Pharisees. Just a little bit of it can corrupt an entire culture of grace. In Luke 18, Jesus tells the story to make the point about how dangerous self-righteousness is. He says this, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. You know the parable, two, went, two men went to the temple, one's a Pharisee, one's a tax collector. The Pharisee says, Lord, thank you that I'm not like this. You know all the things I do. And then the tax collector won't even look to heaven, just beats his chest and says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, it's the, it's the sinner who was, came home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. 
The problem is we live, in a, we live in such a judgmental time, don't we? We live in a time where everybody feels like they have to give an opinion on everything. I'm often amazed at the breadth of the characteristic, or the breadth of the topics we perceive ourselves to be experts on. It's like we have strong opinions on international policies. It's like, you on international policies? The, the, the UN's right there. What are we doing? Let's get you over there. <laughs> As if we understand the nuances and the complexities of the depth of relationships in all of these nations and the factors that go with them. Sometimes it's the performance of the head of the local PTA. Sometimes it's the haircut of a favorite celebrity. Sometimes it's the way we judge people on surface levels. They're lazy, therefore I'm not going to help them. They're disorganized, therefore they're unreliable. They don't value theology, they're shallow. They don't watch their kids closely, therefore they're irresponsible. We could go on and on and on and on. But the fruit is we just live in a world that... It, there, there used to be things called critics, and they didn't exist to criticize everything. They exist because they had a nuanced, well-trained opinion on things. And now everybody's a critic, except we don't have the well-trained opinions. We just have a spirit of judgmentalism. There's a certain restaurant which will remain nameless for the sake of my love for this great city. It recently made a switch from some of the world's best food to a vegetable-only menu. <laughs> and just reading the New York Times Review, I had a, a friend who worked there, a New York Times Review, just a proper lambasting roasting of the new menu. Apparently, there's a secret meat room where if you, like, fill out the right form, they still get some meat for the rest of the year. But, this, like, when you read someone who basically has Somalia instincts and has spent their whole life training to appreciate a palate, and you watch him do a takedown, it's pretty breathtaking. <laughs> but how well they are trained to do it. We don't have those people anymore. We think we're those people. And it can be really bad in the church. Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Imagine all the criticism that you gave to others behind their back was given to you in public. Jesus says, what you, you determine the culture of criticism you receive in your life by how much uncalled criticism you give to others. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? This is one of Jesus' most famous popular teaching and most neglected and misunderstood. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly. Jesus' whole point is this is that sin has a way of distorting our vision so we minimize our problems and maximize others. And this whole problem is like you shouldn't be judging people because you don't see clearly to judge them. So the work should happen internally. And it's a reminder the gospel points us inward to repentance, not outward to critique. And so to step in a church filled with godly people becoming like Jesus is to step into a community that is increasingly humble increasingly self-aware of their own sin and their own failures. Thomas A. Kemper says this, Be not angry that you cannot make others as you wish them to be, since you cannot make yourself as you wish to be. It starts with us. There is a young man that used to be in our congregation, no longer a part of our church, um, but he was just, oh my gosh, he was, he was a finely tuned and gifted critic. And whatever you did, I mean, he was, you know, the problem with that verse from First Peter is taken out of context and you read it in the wrong translation. If you read it in the New American Standard Version, the emphasis would have been different. And so I feel like we lost the meaning of the text. And it's like, hey man, we're reading God's Word in the middle of worship. Let your heart get caught up in the living hope. The living hope. Certain people would preach and he would publicly walk out of the room to protest. And uh, gosh, spent so much time trying to pour into this young man. He was so critical. And I try to help him see from God's word. Can you see that all of your strong opinions are not matched by the, the kindness of your life? Well, that's just cowardice. I was like, no, kindness is a fruit of the spirit, mate. 
And then it turns out that in his spare time, he was going to massage parlors receiving sexual favors. And it was just one of those things that, that it just made me realize sometimes some of the most judgmental people, the most self-righteous people, are doing that because there is a wall within they cannot win, so they're projecting it outwards. And it's not always. Some people have genuine godly zeal, but a lot of the time the critique is out there because we cannot change ourselves in here. And so often this is the failure of the church. I'm always reminded of the president of the National Evangelical Association in a war against the legalization of gay marriage while he is taking crystal meth and having sexual relations with a gay prostitute. And it's like the, the loss of witness for the church when we don't get our own house in order. The gospel points us inward to repentance, not outward to critique. I think if we were to sit and have coffee with Jesus... His number one concern wouldn't be everything that's wrong out there. It would be an honest conversation about the state of our hearts. Jesus regularly confronts religious superiority. Second thing Jesus confronts, he confronts our stubborn sins. Stubborn sins. Several weeks ago, framing up this series, I talked about the way of the world and the way of religion. I, I referenced a little chart here, and I talked about surface change versus deep change. And I said, what religion is often content to do is to deal with the, the, the outer behaviors, the top half. So renunciation of blatant sins and renunciation of willful disobedience. But below the surface, this is where so much of the deep sin is in our heart. That's where the roots are. I remember my dad giving me terrible advice when I was young. Here's what it was. He said, if it's green, mow it. And that was his strategy for lawn care. If it's green, man, just mow it. You end up, as it turns out, weeds' commitment to taking over your yard is greater than your grass's commitment. If it's green, mow it. And it's just this perpetual cycle. At some point, you've got to do the work. You've got to get to the roots. It can be hard. Unconscious sins and omissions and deep-seated structures of being in behavior. And and I want to say this. It is, we're, we're sometimes unaware of how deeply we've been deformed by the world, in in the deep recesses of our heart. Things can be very deep. We're formed one decision at a time, one moment, one judgment, one thought at a time, one behavior, one action at a time. And over the course of a life, 20 years, 30 years, this can be millions and millions of micro decisions that create a web that is almost impossible to get out of. And I want to say this, sometimes God can just set set you free in the power of a moment, but and I'm a straight-up old-school Pentecostal. I am a speaking in tongues, slain in the Spirit. I am at most at home in a room where everyone is shouting in tongues. That is my native state. I'm like, if, if, and if there were some flags, I'd be really happy, okay? So if we had tongues and flags, I'd be like, thank you, Lord, these are my people. But to be honest with you, I'm, I'm more and more suspicious about those one-off things that change us forever. I believe it can happen, but I believe we fail to understand how deep sin can be in our lives. Uh, I want to make my case from the Bible. I want to use Peter. Peter, who's discipled by Jesus for three years, he was in the inner core of Jesus' ministry. He saw all the stuff. Jesus would clear the room, but Peter would stay in it. Peter's in the garden being invited to pray. Peter's in the room when the girl is raised from the dead. Peter's on the Mount of Transfiguration when heaven opens and he sees Moses. He's an insider to the glory of the ministry of Jesus. And towards the end of his life, Jesus says to him, you know, like, hey, it's getting really hard. And Peter's like, pulls Jesus aside and he's like, look, we both know something. These guys are fickle. You can count on your boy, Peter. I got you, Jesus. And Jesus is like, I appreciate that so much. But by the end of the day today, you're going to deny me three times. Peter's like, what are you talking about? And then he goes by fire. All the momentum shifts. And he goes by fire. And a teenage girl's like, you got the accent, you're with him. And he's like, what are you talking about? I don't even know him. And one of the most piercing scenes is Jesus looks across the courtyard at Peter after the cock crows. And he says he goes outside and he weeps bitterly. And then he goes back to fishing like none of this ever happened. It's just, it's, it's a wild scene. Well, what the, so here's the Pentecostal doctrine. He just needs the power of God. He needs some power. So, okay, so 
Peter, because he's faithful-ish, because he's faithful-ish, Peter is there when Jesus says, go up into the upper room and pray. And he's there when the fire comes down. Fire, glory, tongues, power, wind. Great meeting, okay? And he stands up. He's filled with the power of God. Man, and he just launches into this speech about how the Messiah came and you crucified him and God commands you to repent. And you're like, that's it. The power of God fixed everything. But it didn't fix everything. Because you see later that Peter still has prejudice in his heart in Acts chapter 10. And he has a vision from heaven. And in the vision he says, no, Lord, which is not how you respond to a vision from heaven. Lord, no. Lord, no. No, Lord. It's like it's confusing. So God has to repeat it multiple times. And then he's in the room where the power of God falls on Cornelius. But, but I want you to see that underneath all of that power and glory and ministry, Peter still fears people. In Acts chapter 11, we have one of the greatest outpourings in the New Testament. That's really remarkable, the revival in Antioch. The gospel crosses barriers. And um, it just becomes the base, the apostolic base of the Apostle Paul. And then here he is in the city, and then something happens. And I want you to see how Paul responds to him. In Galatians chapter 2, it says, When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas, the son of encouragement, was led astray. So I want you to see this. Peter has been discipled by Jesus for three years, been on the absolute inside of everything Jesus has done. Peter was there, filled with the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church, the power of the new covenant, and still he's afraid of the Judaizers years later. His idol in his heart survived the power of Pentecost. There's stuff that can get in here that has to be rooted out slowly. And it took a lifetime of surrender and formation and crisis and confrontation where eventually he's crucified upside down and really surrenders to his call. And I want to say it's possible for people to be in leadership. It's possible for people to serve and have everything right on the outside, but the heart controlled by some deep primal fear. And I want to say this, and, and by the way, very rarely in New York do people have, A, enough time to watch your history because it's so transient to really map the deep patterns of your heart. And secondly, the margin to get in there and poke around because when you get in there, you get that golem moment. It's like, it's just like my prash. It's like everything's fine until you touch the idol. You ever been in a conversation where you just see someone's whole being shift? And a lot of times you just think, I am going in there, not me. You're it. You know, it's like, but Jesus goes in because he cares. Lisa Fitzpatrick says this, how can I tell if I'm worshiping the blessing that I desire or God? Let me summarize it this way. If you're willing to sin to obtain your goal, or if you sin when you don't get what you want, then your desire has taken God's place in your functioning as an idolater. If the thing is threatened and you sin in response, it's a sign that something else is there. I think Jesus is committed to having a church filled with people who love him truly from their innermost being. So Jesus will confront these deep structural sins of our heart. Third thing, Jesus will confront our hidden sins, our hidden sins. I think this is, I think of the story of King David. You know the story of David, he is supposed to be out in time of war and, and uh, he's on a roof and he sees a woman and she's married but he doesn't care so he brings her into his house, has sex with her, she gets pregnant. It's a disaster and so he says, I've got to get rid of the husband. So he get, brings the husband back who's fighting for him and he says, hey mate, we're old friends, go spend a little time with your wife. And he's like, God forbid that I would ever be unfaithful to you, my king, and my brothers in battle by spending time with my wife. 
gets him drunk and he still shows up refusing to participate. So David says, thanks for your loyalty, kill him. That has him killed in battle. And for all intents and purposes, David feels like he's gotten away with it. Oh, Uriah's dead, that's tragic. And anyway, well, he's got a widow, I'm the king, I better take care of her. She's pregnant, well, I'll take care of the kid too, just kindness of my heart. He's moving along with his life like everything is fine. And then Nathan shows up and confronts him. The, the most fascinating thing about the confrontation is how angry David gets at the proper theological response to sin, yet in the blindness of his own heart, he fails to see that he's the person. And so he, he, gets, he gets attacked, and then he gets hit very hard with the truth of what's happened. Then he responds. And this this. There's there's a thing in human psychology that says, if I did it a while ago and I sort of forget about it, it's done with. It doesn't work like that. Now, I've been here in New York for 16 years, almost a New Yorker at some point, and um, I've never had a speeding ticket. Mm -hmm. Except during the pandemic, there was no traffic, I got my easy pass canceled, for, suspended for six months. Some of you are like, can you even get an easy pass suspended? Oh, you can. <laughs> you can. And so I got over a thousand, like they didn't tell, they don't tell you that it's suspended. They just fine you $65 every time you pass a toll. So when I get the thousand dollar plus bill, I'm like, something's not right with my easy pass. <laughs> so I, I call them, call this number. And they say, well, you, you sped through the Lincoln Tunnel. And I'm like, because I'm a pastor and it's a pandemic, and I've got to get to my peeps who are in need. <laughs> got to serve the people. I said, look, you can check my... So, by the way, they, they do, they give you a warning. They give you a 30-day suspension, a 60-day suspension, a six-month suspension, and then they can't, you're banned from Easy Pass. I'm like, how fast was I going through the Lincoln Tunnel? You seen those videos when the Porsches do 200? Fast. (laughs) Didn't feel fast. It felt like a video game. There was no traffic. So I call the Easy Pass people, and I'm like, I've got people skills. These people, like, people just call them and scream. I'm going to say, hey, it's probably been really stressful during the pandemic. I want to say thanks for all you do. I know it's been really hard. grateful for the way you serve our city and just thank you. Uh, You're talking to John Tyson, um, a pastor, local pastor, and um, I, like you, are committed to serve the city in holistic ways. I'm I'm, I'm doing all the things, and I'm like, here's what you need to know. For 15 years, I've been driving. 15 long years. Never had a speeding ticket. God be praised. And... um, so I'm just wondering if you can do me a solid. By the way, I never plan to get a speeding ticket again. So if you can, do, how about like all of my good non-speeding cancels out that one moment of horrific speeding. And we just like, if we can put it on a scale of like how much I speed versus this one moment of weakness. And she's just is like, no. No. You have to wait till the time's up. So I call, I honestly call back a few months later, try a different person. Hey, it's been a few months. I've really been reflecting on what you guys said to me. And I'm a lot more in alignment than I thought I was at the start. However, as we're coming out of the pandemic and there's a lot of mental health issues with people, I want to be, you know, I'm trying everything. It doesn't work. A hundred good deeds don't negate the one deed that happened. You can't get rid of it like that. That's not how sin works. I had a friend who sat down with me once and he went into sort of like a recovery program, one of the anonymous programs. And I've known this person for 20 years. And he said, I need to talk to you about some really serious things. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, you know, I've been struggling with addiction. You've known that. But one of the steps is doing a sort of like a ruthless moral inventory about the people I've sinned against. And I, you know, lived with you for a while, very close to your family, and I just, I need to ask for your forgiveness. I want to confess some stuff. And I just remember, like, some of it I knew, some of them I didn't know, but I was like, this dude had the fear of God on him. 
And it was so serious. It was so intense. I thought, that's, that's, that's what it is. That's what God does. It's when He really convicts us and He confronts us, we're not going to say, well, it was a long time ago. All sin, unconfessed sin, is present in the sight of God. You read about times of revival? Let me tell you right now, in times of revival, what, what people's description of revival is every unconfessed sin I had over my whole life was present in a moment and I thought my soul would collapse. And that's God's mercy because He knows there's no joy in burying our sin. There's no joy in forgetting it or glossing over it. And so He convicts us and moves us in. And I think it's an important point that I want to say this. You can leave this church, you can go to another church, you can go to another city, you can go to another community, but if you've got an unconfessed sin and the Holy Spirit's put His finger on it, you will literally be at the same spiritual point even if you try and reinvent your whole life. You will never go on to maturity beyond the point the Holy Spirit has convicted you of a sin. And so we've got we to be honest and we've got to say, Lord, even, I need this ruthless, fearless, moral inventory of my heart. And it amazes me how when people really experience the power of God, this is one of the things that happen. God gets to the hidden sins. And then lastly, what God does is I think He confronts some of the things we tolerate. Every city, every church, every town has a different culture. And there's this very simple principle called enculturation, where it's just basically like the culture, you become one of us, the culture gets you. I've mentioned this before. But when you're in it, it can just seem so normal after a period of time, you can forget it. And it's not till someone from outside looks in that you get a different perspective. And this is what happens when Jesus gives people feedback about what's happening in their church. In Revelation 2, he's talking to the church at Thyatira, and he says this, I know your deeds your love and faith, your service and your perseverance, and that you're now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel. Now, at this point here, you're like, let's just do a quick recap about the things you've said, Jesus. You know we're busy. You know that we have love and faith. We are serving you. We're perseverant. We're doing more than we did at first, yeah? You're welcome, Lord Jesus. But he says, no, nah, but I've got this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel who calls herself a prophet, and by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to white horse. Leadership people often say you get what you tolerate, not what you want. And I think that's true. We are, our culture is defined by our minimum standards, not just our aspirations. And when you live in a place like this, it's amazing how quickly certain sins get tolerated. Pornography, pornography addiction is just normalized pride normalized, worldly ambition normalized, hatred normalized. And it's so hard to be vigilant. Slowly your convictions just get chipped away at and then you start going, well, at least I'm not like them. I mean, I do this, but at least I'm not doing that. And we can forget that our standard is Jesus' vision for his church, not just our willingness in our cultural moment to follow him. If you go different places, you realize there's so many things chipping away and it makes me ask, well, what am I tolerating? What am I tolerating that if a saint from another generation popped in, they would just be like, yo, John, what are you doing, mate? You're a pastor. Like, you, you can't do that. What are you tolerating that people from different times in history would say like, hey, just so you know, you think that's normal, that's not normal in the kingdom of God. I think no matter how much momentum we have as a church. And I'm so grateful for where our church is coming out of COVID. So many churches struggling. I feel like we're in a position of strength, mainly because of the prayer culture. But it's like we can get carried away to our blind spots because of our vision and all of the good things happening. I think Jesus would still walk amongst the church and he'd say, yeah, but there's too much New York in this church. When worldliness gets in the church, it kills the church. Now, at this point, some of you are like, this is my first time. This is heavy. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. I love you too. <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's, so, I'm, so I'm, I'm, this is a revelation that's happening to me like two weeks ago in my own devotions. I'm just sitting here going, oh, gosh, I am a strength finder and lover. Oh, God, I feel like you're coming in and you're exposing some of the low places of my character. 
And it can, to be honest with you, there can be a fear of confrontation in our world today. He's just like, oh gosh, like, and I thought, like, I try to get in touch, like, with my inner man. Like, what are, what are the feelings that come up whenever, whenever this sort of confrontation comes? Well, the first thing, you feel a sense of shame. Like, to be honest with you, sometimes I'm embarrassed. I'm like, I've been a Christian for 26 years. I thought I'd be more like Jesus at this point. Like, gosh, is at some point do I just, like, get Wesley's vision of, like, Christian perfection and just go from strength to strength, glory to glory. You know, I just, like, got old Pentecostal verses in me, and I'm like, why aren't they working for me? There's something fundamentally wrong with me, a sense of shame. So I'm afraid for Jesus to really confront me. And sometimes I feel inadequate. You know, New York's an intimidating place, and everybody's faking it. They're faking it, or they're full of pride. Both ways, it's not pleasing. And so it's like, oh gosh, what if people really see that I'm inadequate, that I don't have what it takes, that I've been pretending and I've been hyping it up? What if, what if, what if people learn in the church or in my group, I don't have what it takes? And then ultimately, I think the deep fear is a sense of rejection. It's like, it's one thing when the world rejects you, you kind of expect that, but if the church rejects you, it's like, oh, that pain is so deep. You feel any of that? If I feel this sense of heaviness, but, but I know it's true and important, yet I have this sense of concern about it really happening in my life. Well, one of the things, and I think this is the, the good news, is that we're not just confronting each other like the world confronts. Like, you know what, I want to have a tough conversation with you right now. I was like, I don't want to have that. I don't want to have that. It's that Jesus' conversations are all motivated by love for you. All confrontation in the way of Jesus is a confrontation of love. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. God knows our eternal destiny, and He knows these small things, if not confronted now, could sabotage our future. You look at some of the public pastoral failures, don't you wish someone confronted them a little harder, a little earlier? I bet they'd have anything now for a stronger word in their life. The kindness of God leads us to repentance. If, you, if I've got two adult children now, it's weird to say, but adult children, man, it's like whew, some of those teenage years were hard. But I love my kids too much to simply try and be their friend, and to be their parent. And sometimes I have to have hard conversations with them, and both of them, independently of each other, have come to me and said, thank you for the confrontation. Like, I didn't like it at the time, as it says in the book of Hebrews, no discipline seems present in the moment. It wasn't pleasant. But I, I cared about who they'd be in their 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, and when I'm dead and they continue on, who they're going to be for the long game. So it's out of love for who they are that I have to step in now. This is God's love for us. And the thing that I'm so grateful for is that Jesus is so merciful in this confrontation. Look at the patience, patience of Jesus with Peter. Peter is always getting it wrong, and Jesus is always restoring him anyway. And that commitment to the long game, Jesus is committed to you, and he's so faithful over the course of time. The culture wants you to be successful, so it will leverage your gifts and ignore your weaknesses, but Jesus wants you to be whole and holy. So he'll acknowledge your gifts, but he's going to focus on your brokenness to bring you restoration. So we've got to have the conviction of the kindness of Jesus' heart, and then it's only when we realize who it is that confronts us that we're willing to open ourselves. And this, to me, is a simple process of acknowledging the embarrassment. Jesus, I wish I was more like you, and acknowledging his heart, but thank you that you love me anyway. So therefore, it enables us to truly open ourselves and just to say, search me, search me, Lord just inviting the Holy Spirit to come through and just get deep into our motives. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. Offensive to you, God. Lead me in the way everlasting. So we have to be willing to really invite God into those deep, those trust structures of the heart those deep, unexamined things that no one talks about. Holy Spirit, I invite you in. Conform me more and more to the image of your Son. 
And then it's embracing the loving discipline of God. The whole point of Hebrews 12, you've got these believers who are discouraged because it's so hard. But then the author, humbly I think it was Apollos, but the author of uh, Hebrews says, endure hardship as discipline, God's treating you as his children. And it says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. And that's what God wants for you. He wants a harvest of righteousness and a heart of peace. But it only comes through discipline. So we have to be willing to sit back and to say, okay, Lord, you can discipline me. Prune me, Lord. And I've gotten into gardening lately. It's a long story. It's connected to a prophetic word. Don't judge me. I'm not in a middle-aged crisis. The motorbike is a middle-aged crisis, but the gardening is a prophetic word, okay? <laughs> but pruning, pruning, pruning plants down to a nub, like a little burnt nub, and that pruning process is awful. Then you come back several weeks later, and it's extraordinary what happens. God, prune me, discipline me. I'm yours. And then ultimately, it's learning to do this with a non-defensive spirit. Defensiveness shuts down the activity of the Holy Spirit in your life. Defensiveness will stop the work of God. There's a picture here by Angelica Kaufman, and it's a picture of Angelica Kaufman. It's, it's David being confronted by Nathan. I love this painting. The power dynamic here is the prophet towering above the king. If you study body language like that, that is like a full-blown accusation body posture, the pointed finger. But what I love in this picture is David's heart. Look, look at his body language. He's just kind of like this. He's like, you got me. You got me. I'm the man. And this posture, this sort of openness, the, the humbling of the head for a king, the raising of the hands in non-defensive recognition, well, God can do anything with that attitude. And one of David's darkest moments goes on and gives us one of the most beautiful revelations of Jesus' restorative power. He's going to end up saying, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. In your great compassion, blot out my transgression. In the Old Testament, there was no forgiveness. There was, no, that there was, sorry, there was a death penalty for murder and adultery in the Old Testament. David was done. And yet he reaches into the mercy of God, into the new covenant, and pulls it back into his moment by understanding the heart of God. Blot out my transgression. And he says, then, then I'll be able to teach sinners your way. It's an amazing image of restoration. See, there's always a choice. A defensive spirit will lead to disaster. You go somewhere else and God will just wait. God's so much bigger than your ability to run from him. He'll be wherever you go next. He'll be in whatever relationship you're in next. He'll be in whatever job you're in next. And he'll just be patiently waiting, saying, let's talk about that. Because I want, I want a harvest of righteousness and peace for you. And so let's be people who, not like Judas, who lose all hope. Let's be people like, people like Peter who are perpetually restored in spite of our many shortcomings by the mercy of Jesus. So next slide here, if we just go back to the barrel I just want to say, when you think about discipleship, a lot of you have built discipleship around your preferences. You go to churches that you like. You listen to worship that you like. You listen to teachers that you like. You read books that you like. And what you're doing is ensuring that whole parts of your personality are unformed because your whole discipleship is built on preferences. And we have to open up our hearts and say, Lord, here's the whole of my life things I'm uncomfortable with, things I don't even like, but what I want more than any of my preferences is I want you, Jesus, to be formed in me. I want Christ in me, the hope of glory, to be the true reality of my life. And so if you were to see that barrel, not how good are your strengths, some of you are staggeringly gifted in the city of New York. Recognize wherever you go for your gifts. But Jesus wants to talk about your character today. So where's that low point? So I want us to close just by responding and inviting the Holy Spirit to come and search us as a community. And this, this can be terrifying because it can also be life-giving. God's commitment is to peace and righteousness for you. Some of you right now may be here and you're in the process of slowly destroying your life and today is a divine intervention. Divine intervention. So I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit just to come and just to search us as a church. 
And I just want to perhaps anticipate some of the responses. Maybe some of you have got self-condemnation and uh, you've just got the voice of the accuser. And actually what you need is to realize that God has forgiven you and to receive his mercy. Some of you may feel a very, very severe sense of the discipline of God. And I want to say this, if you feel a strong sense of conviction, you need to take action on it because this could be God stopping you from something terrible happening in your future. Often the intensity of the conviction is based on the the, the brokenness in the next situation. So God's doing everything in his power to speak to you now. And maybe you're here and you love Jesus, you're doing great, and you're just like, I just want more. And you're just, you're all in and you want to open your hearts. But I would hate for us to hear this much of God's word and then to leave critiquing the talk. Like that this would net out to a critique of the service rather than examination of the heart. So let's all just bow our heads if you're, if you're willing. No one looking around. And I'm just going to invite the Holy Spirit to come. And as I pray this prayer, I encourage you to just pray it for your own heart. As one of the leaders of this church, I'm praying this over our congregation. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come right now and to search us. Come, Holy Spirit. Our hearts are laid bare before you. Come, Holy Spirit, we invite you into the deep, deep, motivational structures of our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit, we invite you into our past, into our memories. Holy Spirit, we just yield our hearts to you. We yield our spirits to you. We just pray you would bring to the surface things that we've forgotten or overlooked. We pray that you would sensitize us to holiness and to the ways that we've compromised with the culture. Lord, it is our desire not to be a church just known for its strengths, Lord. We want to be a church that is known in heaven for its character. We want to be a church that you can trust. We want to be a people that can steward your spirit and your gifts and your goodness. So Lord, if there's anything that is stopping us, we just bring it into the light right now. We just ask you, would you forgive us, Lord? Forgive us of our sin. Forgive us of our neglect. Forgive us of our pride. Forgive us of our lust and anger. Lord, I just pray right now that you would increase the intensity of your spirit for Jesus' sake. Lord, if there's any way we've been avoiding you or getting around it or minimizing, or as it says in Romans, suppressing the truth in unrighteousness, Holy Spirit, we just pray, increase the intensity of your conviction and challenge. Come, Holy Spirit, such as we pray. And Lord, we make it our deepest desire to respond to you now. And I just encourage you, whatever you sense the Holy Spirit's asking you to do, if it's to confess something, to confess it. If it's to forgive someone, to forgive them. If it's to make something right, make it right. If it's to open up something that you've kept hidden, open it up. But we want to be people who fully surrendered and yielded to the Holy Spirit. So Lord, we just pray, come and have your way amongst us, Lord. Father, we pray, save us from ourselves. Sensitize our hearts. We ask you literally for the discipline of God that yields peace and righteousness in our midst. We want a church of peace and righteousness in a culture of fear and ungodliness. We want there to be something different about our community, Lord. So we turn ourselves over to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close in worship. I want to encourage you to stand as we do. But if you felt the Holy Spirit has done something in your heart that is, feels significant to you today, I want to encourage you. We have a prayer team over here. Sometimes there's power in just marking a moment. Sometimes there's power in making a declaration of literally saying, Lord, here I am. I want to put a line in the sand. Sometimes there's power in just having somebody pray over you or agreeing with you. It says in the book of James, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. Sometimes there's power in just bringing something into the light. 
And I want to urge you, if you've heard the voice of God today, do not harden your heart. You don't know if you'll get another chance. You don't know if you look back and this is a pivotal moment. Can, can I just say, I hope you realize how high the stakes are for the church of Jesus in this city at this moment. How high the stakes are. So let's take Jesus seriously. Let's take his discipline series seriously. Let's take a confrontation with him seriously. And let's respond with all of our hearts. So feel free to respond however you feel led, but let's press in together.